Joseph and Jessica first met at a church event in the East Coast city where they lived. They loved to do the same things. The beach, movies, professional sports, running, volleyball, parties. Everyone said they were perfect for each other. They became a couple during a volleyball tournament. Joe's friend Liam was supposed to be Jess's mixed doubles partner, but something happened that kept him from doing so. He quickly dialed Jess and Joe on the phone, told them he couldn't play, and suggested they both team up for the tournament. They agreed. They got together for a couple of short practices before the tournament. She was fearless, diving hard for the ball and providing great sets. He was tall and strong, delivering devastating blows. They were perfect for each other on the court. They won the tournament and had fun with the other teams at the bar afterwards. She was very tactile. She touched him often and was very interested in him. He was captivated by her beauty and the frequent tactile stimulation excited him. In the evening, they reached her apartment. She kicked off her shoes and plopped down on the sofa. He plopped down next to her. Wow, what an incredible day, Jess sighed. This is very important to me too, Joe said. When Liam said he couldn't play, I thought the tournament would be lost. When he introduced us, I thought you were cute, but we'd probably get knocked out early. Well, that's what would happen, Joe replied. Well, as I saw, you are a hot volleyball god. Do you really think that about me, Jess? Asked Joe. Something like that. This whole party and the euphoria of victory made my thoughts become heated. I really like it, Joe said. He turned to her and quickly kissed her forehead. I couldn't even imagine how good it would be today. It's not a realistic expectation of life when a friend approaches you and asks you to play your favorite sport with a partner who is so hot that your mouth goes dry and your head spins. Then it turns out she's not just eye candy. She can actually act. Yes, it was a good day. Ooh, do you still have a dry mouth and feel dizzy? Yes. She rolled toward him until her face was less than a foot from his, ran her hand up his thigh, and ran a quarter of the way around the outside edge of the leg opening of his shorts. How do you feel when I do this? Does this help? It helps me feel dizzy and dry, absolutely. How about this? She quickly slid her hand up the fly of his shorts to the waist on his thigh. He lost his breath. Uh, uh. It adds another dimension that I'm not sure how to put into words. She leaned closer to his face, looked into his eyes, and said quietly, This is, uh, forces me. What? What does that mean, Joe? It forces me. Stress, Jess, and makes my heart beat much faster. It makes me focus on how you turn me on rather than your volleyball skills. Ah, uh, you know, I also have other skills, not just volleyball skills. I'm not really thinking about skills right now. He leaned towards her and pressed his lips to hers. He felt the softness of her lips as their hardness gave slightly, and then parted as her tongue slid across his lips. After a moment, he pulled away and simply looked at her beautiful face. You are smiling. What are you looking at? She asked, sparkling her eyes and smiling with moist lips. I am amazed at how perfectly formed your lips are, how gracefully your eyelashes highlight your amazing eyes, how attractive your nose is, the three freckles under your right eye. So cute, the color of the skin of your cheeks. You are perfect, Jessica. This is all just scary. For the next two minutes, not a word was spoken. A tear appeared on her cheek and, leaving a sparkling trail behind it, flowed down. Then her face moved closer to his. Her lips met his, her tongue pressed against his. Her hand moved to the front and center of his shorts, testing his claim of hardness. I really want to see what else I can make you feel. Come with me. She picked him up from the couch and led him to her bedroom. When they reached this spatial location, she quickly pulled his shorts down his legs and immediately pulled his shirt over his head. She then took his hands by his wrists, placed them at his sides and slowly stepped back looking into his eyes. She slowly pulled her sleeveless T-shirt over her head and tossed it aside. She noticed how he quickly looked from her eyes to the lace sports bra and back again. She smiled. Although she looked into his eyes, his manhood was still visible in her field of vision, 
standing at attention. She pulled her shorts down her very tanned legs and, standing up, tossed them aside along with her shirt. She repeated the same procedure with her panties. His eyes slid down again, and his mouth opened slightly at the sight before him. And again she saw his growing excitement. She smiled widely. Her hands slowly moved up the sides of her bra, forming an X on her breasts. She waited, looking into his eyes. She slowly pulled the lace fabric over her head and stood with her arms above her head, still looking. She saw his eyes slide over her chest. She tossed the cloth aside. She took a very slow step towards him, now staring at his manly tool. He frowned, as if calculating how long it would take her to get to him. Once at arm's length, she grabbed his manhood with her right hand. The touch of her hand took his breath away. She continued stroking with her hands, and then she looked into his eyes as she lifted him to her lips. Mmm. I really, really like making you do this, Joe. Without taking her eyes off him, she gently but firmly pulled him toward the bed. Now I really, really want you to make me feel something. She leaned back against the bed and loosened her grip to place her hands on either side of his face and pull his head down. Within a few minutes, he demonstrated that he copes with this important task no worse than in volleyball. Just before she reached her first climax of the night, a thought flashed through her mind. He is perfect. Life Evolve After more than a year of dating, they chose a wedding destination on a Caribbean island, and after about two years of marriage, they vowed to become one life, one love, abandoning all others, and they got married. They both loved having sex with each other, although Joe sometimes felt like he had a hard time keeping up with Jess. They bought an old house in a great location, and within a few weeks they christened every room and, on a moonless night, the backyard. They were attractive people. Joe was once offered a modeling contract, and Jess had the face of a real cover girl. She was a C-cup, and had barely the minimum required amount of fat on her 5'8 body to be healthy. They were athletically built and kept in excellent shape. They made good money. She worked in the technical equipment department, and he worked in the software development department. They had a lot of fun. They worked a lot. His hobbies included mountain biking and photography. Her hobbies included cooking, keeping up with pop culture, and staying in great shape. Jess loved pop culture quizzes and she loved having fun to show off her exceptional cooking skills. Their friends and family couldn't imagine a more perfectly matched couple. They did everything together and seemed to agree on almost everything. Yes, even politics. In an era when it was politically wrong to be conservative, they were. They both agreed on candidates and even the issue of bonds on the day of local elections. Whenever they had any disagreement on any topic, no matter how personal, they would immediately talk about it fully, even in front of a group, and then come to an agreement and make up, even if they had to walk down the hall and rent a room to properly handle your makeup. When this happened, the friends simply shook their heads, smiled, and said to each other, yes, they are perfect for each other. They were both very good at their jobs. They were both respected members of the team. There was no junior team member at their job, nor a supervisor. Joe's work in computer software development even helped Jess in her work when she was having some problems with a new software package her company paid to develop for her business. It was in beta testing, and she was trying out parts of it. One evening, Joe heard her arguing in their office and went to see what was going on. When she explained the problem, he looked at what was happening and saw the necessary changes to the software. He thought for a while and wrote a small piece of program that was called Routine in his office. He inserted it into their program. It worked like a charm. She thanked him verbally and physically, profusely when, when he explained what he had done. Her work went much faster, and the program worked better for everyone in the company. She didn't tell the company about his change, and he was happy for her when the company gave Jess credit for finding a better way to use their new program. He brought routine into his work and told them why and how he came up with it, and they found it useful in some of the software they were developing. They both wanted to live a good life and manage their finances so they could enjoy good vacations and move into a better house and have better cars. 
Occasionally, Jess would be involved in a project that resulted in a major sale of her company and would receive a large, sometimes six-figure bonus for her participation in the project. When this happened, they sometimes assessed the markets, trends, and their resources and bought a home, usually renovated. Then they made it rentable and rented it out. After seven years of marriage, they owned three houses and a condominium. Joe was their home renovation specialist and rent collector. He enjoyed solving these problems and making small upgrades such as installing electronic keypad locks and security cameras, installing or repairing sprinkler systems, and fixing Wi-Fi problems in the home. Since he had a day job, these activities took up some of his free time. When things like that took up his time, she usually just worked more at her company. One Saturday, shortly after their ninth anniversary, he planned to work on the lawn watering system at one of the rental shops. She thought she simply lacked personal attention, so she took matters into her own hands. Joe, baby, before you waste your time with those water pipes, I need help with a problem. Is there a visible leak? He yelled from behind the garage door he was about to walk through to get to his truck. Because there aren't that many pipes going through our bedroom ceiling. Then you better check it out. He put down his tools and headed upstairs. Entering the bedroom, he stopped dead in his tracks, his mouth open. She lay on their bed, wearing only the bud clamps on her chest, each with a small battery-powered vibrator hanging from each one. They hummed quietly. Her knees were pulled up and spread apart. What the? Oh, baby, she whined, breathing heavily. I think you need to stay home and hang up right here right now. Her brow was furrowed and her lips were parted. He realized that he had been holding his breath, and then he dropped his car keys and tore off his clothes. Laying pipes can be a very complex undertaking and often requires a lot of thought and measurement. Completing the project requires a lot of digging, threading, and pipe insertion. That day he did not leave the house, but he measured a lot with his eyes and thought a lot, concentrating on his lips and tongue. Digging, threading, and inserting parts of the project went very smoothly indeed, so much so that each of them experienced multiple climaxes by the end of the project. They had talked about having children as soon as their finances allowed, and now that they owned several houses and their bank accounts totaled six figures, Joe was eager to get that phase of their life started before they were older. She insisted they wait a little longer to nail down a couple of career goals and make sure their financial future was on the best path. She got a promotion and felt like she had a real career, not just a job. On their 10th wedding anniversary, they won a game of cornhole at a party thrown by their friends and family. The theme of the party was perfect for each other. The entire group then departed in two rented limousines for a four-day tour of the vineyards. Returning home, Joe and Jess began shedding their clothes as soon as they walked in the door and celebrated their anniversary like a married couple should. They celebrated in the living room, on the stairs, and in the bedroom. Life was good, after all. They were perfect for each other. Jess was recognized for her efforts at work when she was promoted to the new position of Director of Divisional Services. She was absolutely delighted and told Joe about it. When she got home... They went to dinner at Le Pomade and celebrated again when they got home, several times that evening. At work, she met a very handsome new guy, very similar to Joe, tall, handsome, in good shape. He was a newly hired director of new accounts and lived in New York, but traveled to the Department of the Interior at least monthly. Many of the women in the office were turned on by his easy smile, the latest fashionable suits, his stylish haircut, and his flirtatious manner. Her workplace had a policy that people did not develop romantic relationships between layers of the organizational chart, so seniors such as the director were discouraged from dating those in lower strata. But there was no hard and fast rule defining no relationships between those at the same level of the organization. The CEO, Miriam, was a divorced mother of two who enjoyed the company of handsome young men. The new guy's name was Curtis Stanley. He definitely noticed Jess. His initial mental assessment was, Damn, Jess is one hell of a hot thing. He asked around 
and discovered that she already had a perfect marriage. He unilaterally decided that no marriage could be perfect without some sexual adventure to spice up the wife's life. Curtis and Jess went to lunch several times to discuss business since they were equals. Curtis did some serious research and found out what her husband does for a living and what her favorite places, activities, and foods are. It also became apparent that she was truly proud of her accomplishments and how she had worked to earn her recent promotion. In meetings and lunches, he often tried to direct comments on topics that emphasized concepts of achievement and made her feel good about herself, saying that she was becoming a better person and more valuable because of her achievements. Their company focused its new account work on New York because it had several potential clients there, and Curtis focused on accounts of the size that would fall into Jess's zone. He often asked her to come to New York to help explain how her division would provide good service after a client signed a contract with their company. She was good at it, and he made sure to highlight her contribution to the contract so that she would receive praise from her boss and colleagues. He very skillfully maneuvered discussions at work so that comments were made that emphasized what a valuable and quality person she had become and how much the company's leadership team valued having someone of her caliber on the team. After work, when she came to New York for meetings, Curtis ensured that they went to the best places and the most interesting events. Jess was looking forward to spending time with Curtis. A few months after her promotion, she found herself caught up in all this, and she and Joe were having sex less and less. Joe initiated a couple of discussions about their relationship, which usually turned into her complaining about work and stress. To try to make amends, she planned to surprise Joe for their anniversary. She booked tickets for a September trip to Italy, where he had always wanted to go. So they could plan together, she told him about it in May, and they celebrated by spending the day either in bed or looking at places to visit during the trip. A few weeks later, her company scheduled an executive retreat for July in Miami. She had to be present. She made a big decision and told Joe about it over dinner. Joe, honey, I have bad and good news. What do you want to hear first? Just put it out there, baby. Okay, I've decided that in order to save money so we can continue to grow our family, the September trip to Italy this year is being pushed back to a future date and we'll be going to Miami in July instead. Joe was silent for at least a minute. I thought you were having an executive retreat in Miami in July, baby. Yes. This is a great thing for us. We get a hotel room paid for by the company for the week, so that saves us a lot of money. It's a great holiday destination and party town with lots of great beaches and restaurants. I bet we can even play volleyball on the beach. But if you work, how will we play volleyball or do anything together? Work should be finished by lunchtime every day, and we can stay the following weekend to make sure we have time just for ourselves, darling. Well, baby, I think we have enough money in the bank and I'd love to spend a week in Miami, but I don't see why we have to cancel our trip to Italy. I haven't been in the new place too long and I don't want to fly away so soon and remain in the dark for two weeks. I also don't think we'll ever have too much money in the bank, but that's beside the point. I have already canceled my tickets for September. We'll just have to restart this process sometime in the future, and now we can plan some fun things for Miami. Further discussion changed nothing. Joe decided to make a reservation at the restaurant in advance and see what volleyball tournaments were going on while they were there. Before leaving for Miami, Jess took another trip to New York. Jess never gave details about her travels, and when he asked what she did after work, it was usually described as dinner meetings with potential clients or a huge problem with a West Coast client that needed to be solved to occupy her evening in the East Coast time zone. Julie in Miami, Miami was a great place to relax and relax on the beach. The restaurants were damn good, too. They arrived in Miami on Sunday afternoon and checked into their hotel to get some beach time. They even got an hour of volleyball with a couple matches. It was welcome night that day, and Jess asked if Joe could attend, and her boss, Miriam, the CEO, gave permission. At the dinner party, Jess spent some time with Curtis. Joe didn't like it, and when he suggested she leave or stay close to him, she said it was just business. They were there for a business retreat, after all. Noticing Joe hanging around, Miriam, 
who had always thought Joe was quite sexy, sauntered over to him and started talking. He had already been introduced to everyone, and she knew that he was a technician in another industry and that he was a competent person. She had a few drinks and tried her best to entertain Joe. He sensed that she was getting a little too flighty, running her finger up and down his arm while talking or grabbing his wrist in certain places, and he tried to be polite, but made it clear that he wasn't interested in her, and then walked away. Toilet to get away from her. Miriam felt awkward and didn't like it. The event finally ended and Joe was able to convince Jess to hang out with him at the bar for more drinks, but Curtis showed up and it wasn't much time together. In the end, they decided that enough was enough for today. Once in their room, she is too tired for any amorous activities. As Joe had feared, Jess's work sessions tended to run much longer than expected at 5 p.m. and they had four nights of executive-only events. He would often sit in the hotel hallway and wait for her to come out either at the end of the day or around lunchtime. Joe did get some volleyball time and the beach was full of hot women, but as nice as their attention was, their attention wasn't the kind of attention he wanted. When Miriam, still resentful that Joe had rejected her advances, realized that Curtis was making harsh remarks about people below the executive class, she joined in. She later used Joe as an example of worker bees versus supervisors when the topic of people at different levels came up in hiring discussions. In short, Miami wasn't a big anniversary celebration, including weekends after work. They had sex maybe four times. Disappointing anniversary celebration for Joe. Jess left, excited about her place in the company. When they returned from Miami, life continued much the same as before. He worked. She worked. A lot in New York. Whenever Joe asked about her time there, he received the standard answers. In mid-September, he made another attempt to talk about it. Baby, until this year I never thought your company was so focused on New York. What changed? Asked Joe. You're right, dear. That wasn't the case. But now it turns out we're growing quickly, and it helps to have a critical mass of customers in one place so our people can handle multiple problems in one trip. Why are you so busy with sales? Miriam says. Having a post-sales service person with the client during part of the sales process results in greater closing rates. It looks like it really works. Either way, this is all part of the year-long push, and it should slow down after this, and the company will still continue to look for sales, and the focus will shift to services much more than sales. I have more meetings in New York this week, and then nothing but a trip to the Midwest the first week of October. Joe was looking forward to having her home for the next week, and hoped that when this year-long aftershock was over, they could get back on track. They became more like roommates, and their time of physical intimacy was reduced to about four times a month. Jess returned home from New York on Friday. Joe welcomed her home with grilled steak and her favorite wine. She hugged him and kissed him briefly. A little later, she poured herself a second glass of wine and said, Thank you for preparing this wonderful meal, dear. It's like a holiday. Baby, I'm just happy you'll be home for the next week. I hope we can relax a little. The relaxation will be too short, honey, she replied. I need to return to New York on Saturday evening. Tomorrow? I thought you'd be home all next week. What should you do on the weekend? Joe was clearly upset. I'm really sorry. This is how the plan falls apart, she said categorically. Joe stood up and silently put away the dishes. She sat like a leader, watching him move around the kitchen and dining room and sipped her wine. They barely spoke while he was cleaning. Since he was cleaning and didn't feel like the evening was going to be a really enjoyable one, he moved into the laundry room and started loading laundry. Do you have anything I can wash before you leave, Jess? No, that's not necessary, Joe. All is clear. All is clear? You just returned. It's usually expensive to do laundry at a hotel. Does your company pay for this? No, I did it at Curtis's apartment. What? Why? That's where I stayed the last couple of times in New York. Joe looked at her silently. His mind was in shock. It just didn't make sense. Uh, uh, were you trying to save money or something? Why did you stay with him? No, this was not a cost-saving measure. 
Look, I think there needs to be some change in our lives, in my life. In a very short time, I will be looking at 40 in the rear view mirror. When I look through the photo album of my life, I want to see certain things. If my life stays the way it is, these things will simply never happen. The last two meetings in New York brought all this to the fore, Joe. Now I'm the executive director. I work with top managers and deal with them now. I am a director and have been working with another director in our company for several months. After work, we can go to the Broadway Theater and see a play or to the Metropolitan Museum of Art. We dine it at the Rainbow Room and places like Luger and did a lot of fun and elegant things. He is always dressed in impeccable tailored suits and treats me like a queen. These are the images I want to make the rest of my life out of. Joe, you're a good guy, and we had a great time and did some fun things, but I just can't see someone like you in the pictures I want to fill in for the rest of my life. You will always be a good guy, a good-looking guy who is content to be a lower-level service provider, the guy who installs door locks and sprinklers. You will never become a leader to whom people obey. You will never be what I want, no, what I truly deserve and truly need. You and I are just different people. But baby, we talked about children and our future together. I don't think this body has time to break down long enough to make babies. It won't happen, Joe. Crap. Did you sleep with that guy in New York? This is not a question you have the right to ask me. Why not? I'm your husband, the person you married and said you loved. Once. This is my body. I will sleep with whoever I want. If I want to fuck the entire New York Giants football team, it's none of your business. Two. I think I probably never really loved you or should have, so you just need to understand that it was a mistake and be mature about it all. Three, I'm filing for divorce, so it will be. And don't call me baby anymore. I just don't think that's an appropriate way to address someone who isn't your wife or isn't going to be. We will no longer sleep in the same bed. Joe was completely stunned. Various thoughts were spinning in his head. Beat up this idiot? to hammer some common sense into Jess. Throw her out of the house. Pack your bag and leave the house. What did he do that was so bad that she felt the need to look elsewhere? Was he actually a lower class man than Jess or this other guy? Let me try to understand the situation, Jess. You are going to divorce me because you would rather be with another man who is better than me, right? Oh, no. Yeah, I think that's a fair summary, Joe. When you were first promoted, you didn't feel it. We celebrated and talked about how this could shift our schedules for the kids. Since then, I realized that we are just different people. But you always told me that we were perfect for each other. Why not now? After spending all this time at a party with an asshole director, did you get this cool nonsense into your head? It's not just about him. And his name is Curtis. Others see it too. What do other people say or imply that I am a low-class person to be around you? Other people whom even you know and respect. Oh, really? For example, who? Miriam, you know, and Gloria, the financial director, and another director at work. Seriously? I thought Miriam liked me. So your entire new group of executives at your company thinks I'm a low-grade idiot. Please don't delay, Joe. Are you going to take the guest room or am I? It's really not suitable for us to share a bed anymore. Oh my God, Jess. I think all this time in New York means we've been having sex since you had sex with that other guy. Joe, please, everything is over. At least you're absolutely right about that, baby. I'll take the guest room. Joe headed down the corridor and gathered his things for the night. While Jess was flying to New York, Joe was looking for a family lawyer. He met a very attractive blonde with sparkling eyes and a serious expression on her lips. When they sat down in her office, she asked, How can I help you, Joseph? Please call me Joe. And I feel more comfortable with Melanie, or just Mel. I need help with a divorce. I need details to give you appropriate advice. Joe laid out the situation, and Mel warned him about the physical abuse, asked him about his feelings about reconciliation, and then gave him a list of tasks to complete while she prepared the legal documents. He began taking the necessary steps to separate their finances and other legal relationships, such as car ownership. Dividing up the houses was difficult. 
so he and Mel worked out an offer that he thought was fair. Joe notified their circle of friends and relatives. This action prompted an angry call from Jess in New York. You're an asshole. Who gave you the right to announce our divorce to our friends and relatives? You did it, Jess. When? When you said you were divorcing me and that you'd rather spend the rest of your life with that idiot in New York. I expected that we would just point it out when it came up during family events instead of making a huge announcement. Besides, I didn't give you permission to say that. What's wrong with the wording? Jess read from the note she received from her sister. Unfortunately, I have to announce that Jess has decided to neglect her wedding vows and took a new lover from her company, who seduced her. We will not be able to attend social events or otherwise participate in our former relationship with you as a loving couple. Please respect the sensitivity of our situation and allow us to end our marriage as soon as possible. What's wrong with all this, Jess? You wrote it like I was some fool who allowed herself to be seduced by some smarter or more powerful guy. I stand by my opinion, Jess, although it doesn't really matter at the moment, does it? This has already been sent to everyone. You wanted a divorce and I wouldn't stay married to you, no matter how much I loved you a week ago, because, as you pointed out, it's inappropriate to sleep with someone who's essentially an admitted slut. I have been tested for STDs and I am awaiting the results and I suggest you do the same. If he had sex with you while you were married to me, he could have fucked other fools who allowed themselves to be seduced by him. You... E bastard! She ended the call and almost threw the phone on the table. Although Joe got some satisfaction from this, he still didn't sleep well. He couldn't help but think about what he had done wrong or not right enough. Thoughts of all the truly wonderful times they had together kept running through his mind. The trips they took, the places they made love, the ways they made love. The food seemed to be losing its taste. Their lawyers did their jobs, and the assets were divided. They each maintained their own retirement accounts, and the cash accounts were separated. Credit cards were canceled and reissued to individual accounts. He didn't want to live in the house they lived in when they were in love, so she got him in the apartment since it was closer to the city center and better suited her new self-image. The documents were changed and recorded. He moved into an apartment since the two houses that remained behind him were permanently rented. His apartment was not far from the condominium they once owned together. Two months after Jess announced the need for changes in her life, with the exception of legal matters, they no longer spoke. From time to time, they found themselves at the same church or social events. The first time she took Curtis, she insisted on reintroducing him to Joe. Curtis extended his hand and couldn't help but grin. I've heard a lot about you, Joe. Joe looked him in the eyes, but did not extend his hand. Mutually. I wish I knew where this was going when I first met you in Miami. Joe looked at Jess, shook his head, and turned away. As time went on, Joe observed the actions of their mutual friends and divided them into two groups, those he could trust and those whom he could expect that anything he said would most likely come back to Jess. Some people, he decided, would simply no longer be part of his social relationships. He can play catch or drink beer with them in a group, but his feelings and inner thoughts must be kept out of their reach. Joe decided that Neil Sadaka was right. Breaking up is hard. When Joe's friends at work found out about this, they were very supportive. The boss called him into the office and sat him down. Joe, if you need anything, just let me know. This must be very difficult, and if you need time or someone to talk to, I'm here. I've had relationship problems in the past, and sometimes it helps to make decisions and keep things organized in my mind to talk about them. Thank you, Evan, for your kind words. I know it is difficult to deal with all the things that are part of this kind of problem, and if the thought of revving has not arisen, it will arise. When this happens, Joe, don't take any criminal action like beating up the guy or anything else that could land you in jail. I can guarantee that a few minutes of satisfaction will not be worth the potential years of legal pain and suffering it could bring you. Good advice, Evan. Thank you. Uh, now that you mention it, it sounds like you have some experience in this area. This is true? Maybe. What kind of revenge can a person in my position get? 
That's a good question. There are different types of revenge. I suggest you look at this as if it were a programming problem, Joe. Lay out everything. Specifications. Risks. Unacceptable elements, such as physical violence and various areas that you might consider to provide what you might consider to be retaliation. Maybe financial. Maybe legal. Maybe social. You have to decide what areas are important to these others and be creative, as you have been in your work here. Okay, you've given me a lot to think about. If you need time, just let me know, Joe. Joe went out and sat down at the table to think. He got permission from Evan to use the conference room and got to work using an old board on an easel. He listed the following types of revenge, social, financial, professional, self-esteem, legal. He decided to gather a couple of his close friends at work and help him figure it out. They persuaded him to add physical and technical pain to the list. They laid out a matrix with these categories in the column on the left and ideas of revenge in each category on the right. They allowed ideas to flow freely without judgment to facilitate creative thinking and ended with some outlandish ideas and some that were promising. At the end of the day, he took a photo of the whole thing and put the whiteboard in an empty box from a large whiteboard that was mounted on the wall and put it in the closet at the back of the room. Evan called him and said he hoped Joe would feel better and repeated his offer to do what he needed to do. But after today, please limit his use of other people's productive time before lunch and after work. Joe thanked him for his patience. A couple of days later, a friend from church was playing racquetball with Joe. Are you going to participate in the annual church beach volleyball tournament next month? He asked Joe. Well, I didn't think about it, Joe replied. My volleyball partner and I broke up. I know, but it always puts you in a good mood and I thought you might want to join the boys team or something. Probably not this year, Joe replied. Okay. I saw that Jess checked in and thought of you, Joe. Did she sign? Yeah, mixed couples. Oh, what is the registration deadline? A week before. Okay, thanks for the reminder. After thinking about it all night, Joe took out the board after entering the office. He drew a new line at the bottom and added, Sports results to the first column. At lunchtime, he asked his vengeance team to spend lunchtime working on the Matrix in the conference room. That same day, he made a few calls and headed across town for a drink with an old friend from his university days. The next day, Ben, who was one of his VC Ru friends, walked into his office and closed the door. Joe, how serious are you about getting revenge on Jess and her world? That's a good question. Why? Because a lot of what we put into the Matrix could be construed as just letting off steam, and some of it could be criminal, like physical violence. But that was only because you guys thought it would be funny. I'm not actually going to kill anyone. I have to admit that I wouldn't feel any remorse if the dickhead disappeared, but I wouldn't take any action to kill it and, at this point, I would never bring Jess back. I could never feel the same way or even trust her to any degree. Okay. This is good to know, but there are other areas where the consequences could be much greater than any of us might think. If you ever thought you might get back together with Jess, you'd want to avoid things like this. Never again on God's green earth will I enter into any relationship with her that involves trust, affection, or physical contact. I was ready to do anything to make it clear to her how much she had lost by leaving me and our marriage. I want her to deeply feel that, in essence, spitting on a person's love and trust has consequences. Love and trust are crucial to a full and enjoyable life, and she knocked all of life's expectations out from under the man who loved her, and gave her his heart and soul. Okay, Joe. And yet, Ben, where did you get this from? I have a few more things to think about, and then we might need some advice from Evan or someone with legal experience. I'll call you back. Joe continued walking along the path. Some days are better, and some days are not so good. He tried to focus on work and volleyball. He found a teammate and decided to take part in the tournament. At work, he erased the physical pain line of the Matrix and directed his attention to new work projects. He didn't hear anything else from Ben and figure it was probably just a mental exercise to remind him not to exercise. Evan, his boss, did not comment further on the situation. 
The volleyball tournament was a big event. There were teams from even neighboring states and other churches, and since they were using it as an outreach program, participants were invited who were not affiliated with any church. It has grown a lot from just a Sunday church fun event that Jess and Joe won ten years ago. This year it started on Friday and continued until lunchtime on Sunday. For dinner after the awards ceremony, the churches hosted a huge barbecue feast. Jess and Curtis were quite a dynamic team and made it through to the mixed doubles. Of course, they made it to the final against Joe and his new partner, Deirdre Didi Hughes. She was a stunning green-eyed beauty in her thirties, with fiery red hair that seemed to form a round halo around her head when you looked directly at her. Her skin was covered in freckles from exposure to the sun. That skin was stretched smoothly over her six-foot B-cup figure, which she covered with the three-four sleeve shirt she and Joe wore as a uniform. There was usually a decent crowd for the finals, but there were rumors of possible subtext to the grudge match, and everyone wanted to see which way it would go and if there would be any emotional outbursts. It was a big crowd. There was one issue that could cause temper tantrums when Joe didn't shake hands to start the match. He claimed that he had an arm injury and did not want to take any chances with it before the match. The match went fairly smoothly, although it probably suited Joe and Dee, Dee more than Jess and Curtis. The last team was fast and strong. The other team was like ballet on the court. Joe and Dee, Dee seemed to simply be where they needed to be to hit the ball or make the shot. Dee, Dee was stunningly graceful, and her ability to fly into the air at incredible heights to strike or block left audiences gaping. There was a point during the second game where things seemed to take a different turn by about five points. Whenever Joe got a chance to make a point, he seemed to stop aiming for the open court and start hitting the legs of his opponents. On one of these death throws, he looked like he was about to hit the ball into the open court, but he turned his fist in the opposite direction and hit the ball over the net at his opponent. He hit Curtis square in the face, knocking him to the ground. The game was stopped for a few minutes to wipe the blood from the nose with a rag. After that, there were no more attacks aimed at opponents. The match ended fairly quickly. In straight sets, 21-4, 21-0, a crushing defeat for Jess and Curtis. After the match, the teams met at the net to shake hands. Joe extended his hand and Jess said, What about your hand? It's okay, ma'am, Joe replied. Then he said loudly, Good game. Then, quietly enough so that no one would overhear him, he added, You're a team of losers. Jess violently tore her arm out of his grasp and hit him, but he dodged as deftly as he had previously moved across the court. She glared at him, looking around to see if anyone else had heard this conversation. No one was close enough. Many viewers felt that Jess was a total loser, and her jealousy took a swing at him. Everything went smoothly at the awards ceremony. Jess was a little offended when she learned that for the first time, the small engraved plaque on the perpetual trophy would not only have the names of the winners, but also their opponents and the score. At the afternoon feast, Liam asked, Dee Dee, I just can't shake the feeling that you seem familiar to me. Have we already met? I don't think so, Liam, she replied, but I get comments like that from time to time. Dee Dee and I were friends at school, Joe explained. We played a little volleyball with her, but she was always better and made it to the Olympics for the second U.S. team in beach volleyball. She injured her ankle and was out earlier than expected, but she was on TV all the time, and she always gets comments like, I know you. Ah, uh, that makes sense, Liam admitted. Later that evening, after Joe took Dee Dee home, she invited him out for a nightcap. Once she had changed and they were settled on the couch, they were close. She said, I know this started out as a rematch, but throughout all our training and today's tournament, I really enjoyed being back together and spending time with you, Joey. She leaned over and kissed him. It was a long affair that ended with her tongue flicking lightly across his lips as they parted. When he opened his eyes, he saw her lips. He noticed their wet contours and unsteady position. His gaze trailed down the graceful lines of her jaw and down her neck to the top of her breasts. The pattern of her freckles was a sweet counterpoint to her very feminine shoulders and figure. This fascinated him for a moment. He looked into her eyes again. 
Moisture was beginning to form, causing the green to sparkle in the soft lighting. He was so focused on their game that he forgot how beautiful she was. Dee, I would really like to explore a relationship with you, but not now. I came to you for your performance, but I also can't deny that now I think I may want more. However, right now it feels too much like a reflection of my past experiences, and you deserve better than to be in a remake of a movie. I would like to see you go on dates, get to know the ditty you are now. This is more than fair. I actually really appreciate this perspective. I don't want to be anyone's reflection. They finished the whiskey and agreed on a date in three weeks. He walked back to his apartment with a gentle kiss. The divorce was final, and Jess and Joe were now living separately, legally. They were aware of some of the major events in each other's lives because they lived in the same part of the same area of town, had the same friends, and attended the same church. Back at work, Ben asked Joe how he was feeling, and if he was ready to erase the Matrix. Joe thought and said, I still feel that I have not finished ten years of lies, nor ten years of love that was of so little value that it could have been thrown away like an old shirt when given a new one. Okay, the idea I had has evolved, and I think we should look at the Matrix so you can decide how nuclear you really want to respond. Nuclear, how is that? This can have long-term consequences. At noon, the V crew gathered in the conference room setting up the Matrix board. Before they started, Joe said, Ben came up with a new point in the legal row, but first let me fix this. Joe rewrote the category physical pain, and in the square next to it, in red, he entered a bloody nose from volleyball. He continued to write in red for the social humiliation of his initial divorce announcement and his sporting humiliation. Red means it's done. Now it's up to you, Ben. After Ben explained his idea, the room fell silent. His remarks concerned two aspects of the same action. The first action he had already discussed with Evan and was in the process of doing, but the second was left to Joe. A discussion followed about the pros and cons of the actions. The meeting adjourned, leaving Joe to decide whether to take action or not. Joe took a few weeks to consider his options, and his life moved on. He made his decision and moved on with his life. Life included finding out that Jess was pregnant and living with Curtis in the apartment she got after her divorce. Joe hadn't gone to church since the volleyball tournament, but one Sunday after church, he ran into Jess in the parking lot. Are you going to congratulate me, Joe? I thought your hot body was too precious to bear children, Jess, or was his top-class seed too strong to resist? It must have been top-class because it wasn't planned, loser. How long? Seven months. So you didn't even wait until the divorce was final to get pregnant. A top-class seed is a top-class seed, loser. As I recall, looking at the trophy in the church window this morning, you and the idiot are losers. And you're an asshole. Just a simple, simple-minded, low-class asshole. A loser in life who will never achieve anything. About. Just in case you're wondering where I am if you don't see me next week, Curtis and I are going to Monte Carlo for a vacation. A top-class vacation loser. Keep an air sickness bag handy, Joe suggested, turning away. Bye, loser. She got into the car. Decisions have been made. Action has been taken. Life went on. Jess's company encountered some problems that began to complicate the situation. Miriam was on edge, as were the CFO and general counsel. As with all modern companies, this anxiety rippled through the organization. Several people have been laid off and budgets have been tightened. Problems at work exacerbated tensions in Jess's apartment. As her pregnancy progressed, Curtis became less and less interested in doctor's visits and other events associated with childbirth. Changes at work interfered with his travel schedule, and he became a little irritable. His move to their city from New York did not make him as happy as he thought, and their relationship with the upper class became strained. During her work, the root cause of the company's recent problems was identified as a legal issue regarding their software. It turned out that the company they hired to create a software product critical to their services had somehow used a program 
that was the legal property of another company without that company's permission. And since Jess's company was the company that paid them to create product and therefore shared ownership of that product, they shared responsibility for the stolen code. To make matters worse, her company and the software company were selling modified versions of the program for use by even more different companies as part of those companies' service delivery processes. Since the software had been in use for several years, no one could remember who was at fault for using the corresponding code routine. People were laid off from a software company, and legal costs were taking a toll on her company. The company, which was the legal owner of the code, wanted back the licensing fees from Jess's company and all the money they had ever received from other companies for using the software they claimed to be theirs, plus fines. After months of legal wrangling, the options remained unchanged and could no longer be delayed. Jess's company could either stop using its program or enter into a licensing agreement to pay the owner of the rights to the key program code. The software company that developed the program with her company recently closed down and its employees were absorbed into the industry. Not using the program and trying to replace it with some other software company would put them out of business due to the time it would take to do it with a new company that was completely unfamiliar with the product. They were stuck making a cash deal for licensing. This ended with a 10-year declining payment schedule that initially incurred high costs and then began to decline after a couple of years to a reasonable annual figure. The cuts caused by the huge payouts led to even greater turmoil for the company where she worked. Salaries and commissions were cut or eliminated. By the time Jess was approaching her baby's due date, she and Curtis were sometimes barely civilized roommates. One day she came home after work to find that most of Curtis's things were gone and he was taking the last things out of the closet. What are you doing, honey? I left the company for a new job on the West Coast. Need to go. Got a plane to catch, Jess. When will you be back? Our baby will be born any minute. I don't plan to return in the near future. You have health insurance to have your baby. But what about everything we talked about? How to raise him and take care of him? Yes, the more I thought about it, the more I realized that this was not for me. You know what kind of person I am, Jess. I love good restaurants, art museums, and holidays in Monte Carlo. I don't like diapers, strollers, or postponing vacations because of a child. Curtis, how can you say that? I thought you loved me, and once the baby was born, our relationship would go back to normal. I have to go, Jess. Bye. He closed the door behind him. Jess collapsed on the sofa in tears. She was filled with sobs. Tears flowed like a river. My chest heaved heavily. It was difficult to breathe. Suddenly she felt a stream of liquid gushing out of her. Oh my God, my water must have just broken, she thought. She tried to pull herself together and think about what to do next. She called one of her friends from work. Gloria, could you help me? My water just broke and Curtis is at the airport leaving. Oh God, Jess. I'm afraid I can't. I'm at my sister's two hours away. Try calling Anita or Susan. I'm sorry I can't help you anymore, for now. Gloria's cell phone went offline. Jess called the other two ladies. Anita's cell phone went to voicemail. Her call to Susan yielded the answer. This cell phone is not set up to receive voice messages. Her body was telling her there was no more time to waste. She stumbled into the bedroom, grabbed her baby bag, and headed to the car. She had difficulty getting into the BMW, but managed to open the door, throw her bag on the passenger seat, and get behind the wheel. She made the 20-minute drive to the hospital. After only half a mile, she realized she simply couldn't do it. She began having contractions that made driving too difficult and dangerous. It downed on her that there was someone else she knew who lived very close to her apartment and could get there very quickly. She found the number on her phone and pressed the icon on the screen to dial. Hello? Is this Jess? Answered the voice. Oh, thank God. Joe, are you at home? Please help me right now. Yes, I'm here. I was just getting ready for the evening. What do you need and why are you calling me? No time to explain. She didn't want to argue if she had gotten to the point where she needed help, and she didn't want him to refuse to come. 
she thought he would respond to a simple plea for immediate help and, once there, help her get to the hospital. I'm in my car on the street in front of the Ashton Glen Apartments. Please come right now. It's a matter of life and death. I don't think you're dying, but I'm still going to the door and you're very close, so I'll stop for a minute and see what's there. About. Joe, thank you very much. She ended the conversation. Another wave of contractions washed over Jess. She left the headlights on, turned on her hazard lights, and winced as another contraction hit her. Joe arrived about three minutes later and stopped at the curb right in front of her car. Her headlights illuminated a canary yellow Audi R8. Joe got out and walked over to her car. She rolled down the window. Luckily, she didn't feel any contractions at the moment. Thank you very much for coming, Joe. What do you need? Car problems, Jess? No, my water broke. The baby is due right now, and I need your help to get to the hospital right now. Where is the idiot? Curtis just left for the airport. While you are giving birth, just call him back. He will not return. What do you mean? He broke up with me. He doesn't want a child. She started crying again. I can't understand you if you're going to cry, Jess. I'm really sorry. I'll try not to do this. Is he returning to New York? No. He left the company due to our financial difficulties. He got a job in the West. Oh, oh, oh. Another contraction overwhelmed her. I'll help you get to the hospital, Jess. First, give me your phone. She handed it to Joe. He dialed the number. Yes, thank you, operator. There is a pregnant woman standing directly opposite the Ashton Glen Apartments on Avenel Drive. Please send an ambulance. Her water is broken and she's sitting in the driver's seat of a silver BMW with flashing lights. If you need more information, you can call this number back. He shoved the phone back into her hands. Can you take me there, Joe? I don't want to spoil my new car. Where did you get it? It looks very expensive and your suit looks really great. It turns out that the program I wrote to help your company's new software work properly is owned by my company because my employment agreement gives them ownership of everything I create while working for them. But if the employee creates a huge cash flow, he gets a percentage of what he earns. Because your company sold the use of the program to other companies, all of those companies owed my company huge licensing fees. Remember those six-figure bonuses you used to get from time to time? I received a seven-figure payment and more payments are coming soon. Another wave of contractions hit Jess. I see you are in no position to have a real conversation. The ambulance should arrive soon. We must run. I have a date. Bye, Jess. Another painful and demanding wave hit Jess. Joe turned away and walked to his new car. Joe, could you stay until the ambulance gets here and then take care of my car? I don't think so, Jess. This is what a husband, or at least the father of a child, would do. Joe, opening the car door, he stopped, turned around and said, I think I can say that this idiot is an asshole and you are a cheating slut. You and that idiot Curtis Perfect for each other. He got into the car and drove away. Subscribe to our channel so that your second chaff doesn't cheat on you and go ahead and listen to the next story, because this story is nothing compared to the next one. If you're under 18, don't even think about listening to the next one.